want to thank everybody for joining us for today's session, Digitalization and the Future of Formulating in Modern R&D Labs. Today's session is presented by Uncountable and is brought to you by Asterix uh, Technology, who's been presenting a series of webinars uh, from bringing thought leaders from throughout the lab informatics space together now for, uh, we're coming up actually on just about a year. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll get things kicked off. So before we begin, um, I do want to take a moment and just introduce you to Asterix. If you haven't had any interaction with us yet, or if you haven't been on any of our sessions yet, who we are and why we're presenting this series. Uh, you know, we're, we're a company that successfully deliver highly specialized services, processes, technology, and outsource services uh, to fundamentally, mentally transform how science-based businesses operate, you know, all in an effort to improve scientific outcomes and the lives of people everywhere. Uh, the company was established in 1995, privately held today, uh, we originated as the IT division of APBI, a life science research organization, and we operate from seven offices in the United States and one in beautiful Costa Rica, and we're headquartered in Red Bank, New Jersey. In terms of the customers that we support, uh, we're a market leader in dedicated digital transformation services and expert outsource services for the scientific community. This includes companies such as Fortune 1000 Life Sciences, chemical and CPG, government research institutions, Typically, companies that have large and fast-growing IT and outsourced and compliance uh, needs. And we can go to the next slide, please. In terms of the scope of the solutions that we uh, deliver to our customers, it's going to vary. But at the end of the day, the services are going to span the entire life cycle of scientific data systems needs. And this is from the beginning of coming into organizations and helping them understand through business process analysis uh, and an architecture uh, program, we, we try to understand the type of technology that you're going to need going forward to bring your business forward. You know, and that's everything from what is your, what's your lab informatics stack look like to, you know, migration to the cloud, et cetera. You know, those kind of higher level strategic directives. From there, we can get into lab and quality management selection services, helping you select the right technologies, such as Uncountable. And then we can help with development and implementation, and then finally computer systems validation of those systems. And then once that's done, we do provide uh, 360 digital quality services. These are services that help optimize and ensure your systems are operating as expected. Uh, we also have the ability to bring in staff if needed, uh, staff that could just be scientific staff, you know, to come in and staff your laboratory, or technical staffing to come in and help with your uh, actual solutions. So that's a little bit about Asterix. I want to introduce our speaker and introduce, um, <clears throat> of course, the company that we're going to be presenting with today. So we can go to the next slide. So Will Tashman is the co-founder of Uncountable. Um, we're thrilled to have him with us today. He leads all customer relations and new business development efforts at Uncountable as the chief revenue officer. Uh, he has a material science background from MIT, and he's worked on Apple's product design team. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Will, and uh, I'll come back on at the end. Appreciate it, Kevin. Thank you very much for the introduction here. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Will Tashman. I'm one of the founders here at Uncountable. Just to kick this off here, uh, a little bit about Uncountable as a company. So we were founded in 2016. Uh, we were are based in San Francisco. However, we have offices here in Munich and in New York City uh, to better support our sort of diverse customer base. And our customers include a wide variety of companies, from the more traditional formulators, you know, paints. Uh, adhesives, coatings, rubbers, and compounding. Um, two more sort of nuanced, different, more advanced types of technologies from a cosmetic standpoint or a biotechnology or even you know, plant-based food and things like that. Uh, and so our platform is a highly uh, structured but yet highly flexible and configurable system that allows for R&D teams to centralize all of their R&D data and knowledge uh, and reduce experimentation and improve their overall throughput and how they operate. Uh, you can see a couple of the customers here that we have on the right hand side um, that sort of show, again show a wide variety of companies from paints to batteries to cosmetics to food and 3D printing. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit about the agenda for today and what we plan to talk about. So you, you know, for the, those who are on the call today, I think we, we often think about all the differences and challenges that R&D teams face. I think the data story in R&D is very, very complicated and very difficult, and which has led to this sort of amalgamation of current tools used uh, to try and fix that problem, or at least fix it with Band-Aid type solutions. 
Um, so we'll get into a little bit about what data it's typically collected, how it's collected in terms of those tools and systems, uh, and both the sort of new age type tools uh, and, and the sort of, sort of status quo type tools as well. Uh, we'll talk about what it means to convert from old sort of status quo tools to those modern software infrastructure tools and what that really means from an uh, impact on your organization in the short term and the long term. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about our solution just at the end, just to sort of ties uh, a bow on this so you guys see our perspective and where we're coming from in a, in a brief video here. And, and as Kevin mentioned, uh, please feel free to pass along questions or, or write them down um, when you when you think of them and hopefully we'll be able, we should be able to address them at the end here. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the data that gets collected in R&D environments. And these four different buckets can typically summarize all that information uh, in some way, shape or form, right? So uh, within the chemical industry and biotech space, you're, you always start with some sort of raw in the material, raw ingredient input, et cetera, right? There's something that you combine in some way, and those raw materials have their own physical and chemical attributes, their own batch history, potentially you know, some pricing and regulatory issues, uh, and maybe features of themselves. Um, you then go into uh, the um, formulation or the recipe or how those things get put together. And this could be you know, a polymer synthesis, this could be an extraction, this could be a, a compounding event. Um, all of these would mean that you're sort of putting things together in some unique way that is differentiated in, in a way that is si sort of scientifically advantageous. Um, and this could be multi-layered, multi-structured, the order of additions may matter, uh, and that usually derives your, your formulation or your recipe. Then you get into how you process it. Uh, it could be you know, a mixing time, a mixing temperature, drying, et cetera. Uh, and then you have your end results. And these could be physical properties like tensile or tear or hardness or you know, optical type things, or it could be analytical, it could be images, could be stability over time. And eventually you get to this combination and this flow of all these types of data. And <clears throat> this is just for one, you know, this technically could just be one sample has all these branches of information and probably a few more that I haven't listed out here. And so if we transition that to thinking about, well, what does a company deal with, right? That was just one sample, which would have been a part of one project, which would have been a part of one group in one lab. Think about how this sort of compounds exponentially in terms of complexity, um, even when people are making similar things, right? They both make polyurethane foam, or they both make, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, this sort of ceramic type of material. Well, if I do it in one lab in a different location, I use different raw ingredients, maybe I have different equipment available to me. And so all of a sudden, my, my information and my data, again, splits and diverges further and further. And you can imagine, and I'm sure you're all aware of how much of a headache this is most likely going to be. So what does that mean and how do customers and how do scientists and people try and tackle this problem today? It usually starts with the sort of bread and butter of all scientists in, in the 2021, which is a spreadsheet. Um, you know, spreadsheets are either, you know, a scientist has their, their pet sheet for their formulation calculations, or maybe it's a run sheet that gets handed off internally, but the spreadsheet gets involved in some way, shape, or form almost 99% of the time. Uh, but then you also have, you know, ELNs or electronic lab notebooks or just paper journals too, right? People where they write down observations and things like that. You have a LIMS tool uh, where there's, you know, uh, process flow for working, work requests and things like that. Uh, that get done and, and maybe managed with some machine type of equipment inventory type of thing. You then might have a true chemical inventory. So what available, what do I have available in my lab and what were the properties of that raw material, that chemical or that semi-finished good? Um, and then you have all of your analysis type tools, right? So what do we do with this data? Do I visualize it? Do I make reports? Do I do run statistical analysis on it? Do I have um, a team of data scientists that's going to work on predictive tools for me? Um, and then finally, and this is usually the part of the crux of the issue, is that you have all these other internal systems, right? Maybe you have an ERP, like SAP, that has all of your pricing. Um, and then you have a regulatory system that has your regulatory information. And then you might have uh, uh, you know, a second or third system. Again, these might be structured data systems. 
but they aren't connected to anything. So every time I need to go look up a price, I have to go into that other system, and I usually can't export it in some really functional way. So hopefully that resonates with, with you all here, uh, but that's typically what we see across the board from different companies and different users. So you mentioned, you might have heard me say the word structured uh, data, structured information. And I think it's important to bring up this concept here. We very much believe in the value of structured data uh, and the ability to uh, properly create that structure. I think it's, um, there's different types of structured data, but if it's not properly thought out and connected, you still might end up into, in too disparate of an environment. Um, and so uh, when we think about unstructured information, this is probably the stuff you're most familiar with, right? This is gonna be your lab notebook, a uh, spreadsheet, even though it has grid lines, it's still unstructured, meaning that I can basically type whatever I want into whatever cell I want. Uh, and, and that really, you know, the main benefit for unstructured information is that sort of ease of entry of, of data or ease of entry of, of results or whatever it may be. I, mean, I literally can type in whatever I want into my Word document or into my lab notebook or into my spreadsheet, uh, and that's it. Now, the drawback is, you end up in this place where all you can do is basically set up a control F type of keyword search. So even if you know Kevin and I are working on the same type of project, he might call one thing tensile strength, I might call it tensile. And if we want to join these tables, we might have to spend 20, 30, 40 minutes just figuring out how to map the data. Now on the flip side, you go to the structured data environments perspective. You end up in a way, oops, excuse me. Um, you end up in a situation where uh, there is uh, um, uh, uh, different types of opportunities for actually creating this structured environment. So that could be uh, a LIMS inventory system. It could be a, uh, a formulae database. It could be a, um, uh, you know, a, a regulatory system. And the uncountable system falls into that bucket. And so what that means is with that type of system, you're going to end with a wide variety of structured information. You're gonna end with uh, the ability to search and access this data very easily and instantaneously. Uh, but it means that you have to be more thoughtful in how you put that data together. Uh, so uh, does that mean you can type in whatever word I want? No, it means I'm usually picking from like a pick list or a template or something like that. Uh, and this is important for, for uh, distinction and clarification in order to make that all sort of work and be possible. So let's talk about the, the challenges here in terms of uh, what's different about material systems and formulation systems here. Uh, now, I, the, the unstructured versus structured argument I just laid out could have been assigned to any type of business system, right? I could say the same thing about accounting or marketing or sales and a CRM. All of that is, is actually sort of fundamentally the same thing, right? Is can I type in whatever I want or do I have this sort of structured environment in the background? Now, the, in the R&D space, uh, there's a lot more nuance, difficulty, complexity uh, that creates a different type of challenge, which means you're gonna need a different type of solution. Um, so let's talk about how you guys evaluate your, your, your samples or your raw materials. Right, you, you have to go and physically measure them and test them. Uh, well, as you all are probably very well aware, this brings its own noise and very variability into the system. And uh, not every, if I try to test the same formula today that I did test tested a week ago, uh, most likely the results are gonna be slightly different even if I try and set everything up the exact same. You also have this idea of like these multi-layered data sets, right? You have multi-layered bombs, right? One recipe feeds into another. Uh, you might have this order of operations. Uh, that's typically not handled in, in certain types of other business systems. Uh, you have different data types as well. So uh, I might be recording images. I might be recording time series data. I might be recording uh, some sort of categorical ranking. And yet all of that is combined with the standard sort of continuous numerical operations that you might see. And last but not least, you have this concept of data sparsity. Uh, we live in a physical world and you all operate in a physical world, which means that you can't go run a million experiments virtually on your computer because you have to go actually make something. So that means it costs resources 
to actually create experimental data, a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of materials. And so that creates a data sparsity thing, which means that you really want to do as much as you possibly can to maximize the value of your data because you aren't going to be able to create endless amounts of it. And so it'd be a shame to you know, run your 15 experiment DOE, but then you end up having to you know, scrap it or no, one be able, no one's able to learn from it besides you because it's in your spreadsheet and your shared drive on your SharePoint and you know, no one else knows how to interpret it. So let's talk about what that means in terms of adopting a new system here. So uh, when customers come to us and they say, well, what do I do? Like, how do I make this, make this transition? And, and, I, and I don't disagree that this is a large exercise in change management. Uh, but here are a couple of questions that, that come up that are, are typical, again, um, of many different types of R&D type systems, LIMS, things like that. The first is what to do with old data. So uh, you have a multitude of spreadsheets. Uh, maybe it's different cleanliness, different people. Wrote what do I do with that? Do I want to put it in? Do I not? Like, what do I do with different uh, older systems here? And, and so customers often try and sort of figure out how they should approach this old data problem. They, they think and believe that there's this big treasure trove of data in there and information. And there most likely is. However, is it worth the time and effort to get it into a clean space. Um, then there's a question of what do we do and how do we connect to other tools? I think this is a, a critical part here where um, you, you don't want to end up again in this sort of segregated island view of the world where some data is here, some data is there, and it doesn't really speak to each other. You want to present a solution where the scientist is working on a set of tools and a set of uh, data that's connected to a bunch of other data, right? That's the big e ease of use thing. Third is this data security and IT fit. So, you know, this is a new type of data or a new type of storage system. So where is it stored and who has access to it? Uh, how do I audit that access? How do I audit really where changes are happening? All those are very reasonable questions to think about. And last but not least is this idea again of change management. You have scientists probably in your companies that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, and they've been getting along just fine and most likely doing very well. Um, using those old spreadsheet type tools. So how do we go and convince them of what it means to change and, 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 and why to change and things like that? And so typically when we think about this type of process here, um, we're thinking about the idea of um, a couple of ways to, to get them over that implementation activation energy hub. First things first is how do we figure out a way where they can find quick wins in the system. So it's difficult to uh, figure out what the right way is in terms of, um, you know, uh, if you go to a new user and you say, well, what is the, you, know, you won't find anything cool or interesting in here for nine months, but you have to use it. That most likely won't be the, the world's greatest argument here. Um, the other thing that you want to be able to do is you know give them something in the first week month of using it that they could never have done before and so that sort of incentivizes them to bring them into the system here and get them in so that that, that learning curve is, is is met with immediate benefit the second thing and sometimes the most important thing is this ability to prioritize the future over the past so i mentioned that like what do we do with our old data this can sometimes lead organizations to this paralysis by analysis type state where they spend so much time trying to fix their old data they don't necessarily think about how to do this properly if they were going to start from scratch and so our perspective on this is that if you go through this big long process we want you to be able to um, <clears throat> basically get as much as you can out of the old data without sacrificing the, the future data, right? You don't wanna have this old data problem in two or three years because you're still trying to fix that. And so uh, with our customers, we oftentimes try and say, let's shoehorn as much of the old data in as possible into this new preferred ideal data structure of the future. And the last but not least is you have to be able to communicate effectively to a team that's now gonna be collaborating much more closely around you know garbage in garbage out this is a, a cardinal rule or a, a great rule of thumb for all the modern data systems 
if I type in a bunch of gibberish, uh, you know, this is only going to provide um, you know, a bunch of more gibberish back out to the rest of the team. Um, and so we we try and find, figure out the right way to, to approach this for different different types of, of, of users and different types of data. So let me move briefly here into this concept of potential for impact. Um, so what does that mean, right? So in the short term, how does this how does the transition to a new system, a new lens, a new inventory, a new lab module here um, help an R and D team in the very immediate future. Well, there are several of the studies that have been published, you know, and we hear this anecdotally from our customers time in and time out, that scientists are going to spend about a day to a day and a half a week managing their data. And managing is sort of a broad word purposely. We that could be cleaning it, could be searching it, could be using it, could be um, you know analyzing it. Um, but of that day, day and a half, and sometimes more for some people. Um, they they may only use about a fifth of that time, so 20%, 20% type of thing, um, actually analyzing data. And so if you put in a system like Uncountable or several others, um, you basically transform that, that time pie chart to all their time can be done on analyzing and finding and using the data effectively rather than looking for it, cleaning it, doing all the, the bookkeeping type stuff that scientists don't like to do in that regard. And so you end up with a scenario where I get to find all the information I need very quickly. And so if someone's already done this exercise, uh, I should be able to uh, effectively learn from them very quickly and not avoid that sort of reinvention of the wheel that can oftentimes happen in big disjointed R&D teams. Second thing here is this obviously this, this is a, a time specific, which is basically, you know, uh, well, many, teams and, com and companies are, are back to the office. There are certainly portions of teams and companies and, and people who aren't back in the office due to the, the COVID-19. And, and so if you wanna be able to collaborate more effectively in real time and, and be able to say, you know, this work needs to get done or what's my progress here, uh, we wanna be able to help you help those teams with that. And then last but not least, you are able to provide this level of visibility and uh, transparency to uh, managers as to like really where things are being done and where where time's being spent, right? Previously, if someone needed a check in here, they'd go and say, okay, what's the latest on this project? And someone would present them a PowerPoint. Well, what if they can go in and figure out what were the best recipes tested today? How many have we tried? What are we struggling with? And that was all at the touch of the finger. And so that's a couple of those sort of short term, first couple of months type of thing that you get to be able to, to benefit from here. Um, now, if I say long term, Right? How do we think about this in the in the you know one year, two year, three year type of horizon? Um, first is the thing about you are capturing this this level of expertise and knowledge that you really weren't doing effectively before, right? Um, so you might imagine that many of your some people in your company are closer to retirement than they are at the start of their careers, and so when those people leave with all that wealth of information, you know. Yeah, it gets put into a lab notebook, and yeah, it might get put into some spreadsheets, but it's rare we've seen where people have found that information truly accessible and functional. And so with a system like Accountable, you'll be able to capture that expertise much more closely. Uh, and, and, and so it actually becomes this usable asset for people after that. Second is because scientists spend more time analyzing the data and less time managing their data, um, we want to be able to translate that time into more innovative thinking, right? So whether that's they're analyzing the data, they're thinking critically about the chemistry and what they really care about, rather than thinking act like a, a data bookkeeper. And ultimately, this is about delivering a solution to market faster. Uh, so how do we help scientists do that? And how do we help uh, teams and companies, you know, deliver products to market that meet their customers' needs? In shorter times and really accelerate this innovation window across the board here. So with that, I'm going to move into a brief overview of our own system, and I'm going to do that via video. So give me two seconds while I set that all up here.
Looks like you guys should be able to see this now. So if I make this bigger, quick play. Uncountable takes elements from traditional tools such as spreadsheets, laboratory information management systems, and electronic lab notebooks, and bundles them into a complete R and D software solution. Heterogeneous data sets are seamlessly connected within one system making any and all information readily accessible through advanced search and filter tools. Scientists can easily input new data in Uncountable using recipe builders that are designed to manage all the complexities and nuances of a scientist's formulation work. Once the intended recipes have been created, a scientist can submit recipes directly to testing in a lab. Lab test requests can be managed directly from a central request management tool, where requests can be assigned directly to colleagues complete with status tracking, run sheets, and automatic notifications. In addition to the capturing of standard numeric text or image results, Uncountable supports custom uploaders that automatically transpose raw data files generated from measurement machines into curves or any relevant summary statistics that an R&D team deems as important, like tensile, rheology, or analytical data. Uncountable also provides a suite of visualizations for instant analysis and interpretation of the data. Correlation plots automatically surface quantifiable relationships in the data, which can be turned into learnings and sharings. As a scientist finds visualizations that are particularly interesting and help further their research, they can be saved and added to the project workbook. The project workbook functions like an electronic lab notebook where a scientist can collect their thoughts and observations as they progress towards their project goals. Uncountable also allows for the creation of custom reports that pull from any and all information inputted within the platform, and it is easily exported into a variety of different formats. With a wealth of properly structured data within Uncountable, the platform leverages powerful machine learning models to provide predictive tools to each scientist. Users can easily predict material properties, given a set of ingredients and process parameters to get quick insight to see whether their changes are affecting key properties as expected. Even more advanced tooling enables custom ML models to utilize historical data to suggest experiments that are most suitable to reach a scientist's project goals. Unlike traditional experimental design tools, Uncountable promotes an iterative learning process and improves predictive accuracy with each data point. As with all statistical tools, the better the data, the better predictive insights. To deliver as much value as possible, Uncountable's platform is designed to promote easy and complete data capture. Uncountable is the complete enterprise software solution for R&D teams, helping them become more efficient and accelerate the development of new materials. Awesome, hopefully that played okay for you all here. I'm gonna convert back to my presentation mode. Resume. Looks like it is working. Cool. So I think you know we, we I know that video is quick and goes through a lot very very quickly, uh, but I think we wanted to show you um, uh, the the ability for the system to be flexible, um, but also provide that instant access. And, and our our opinion of this is that we want to be able to use this tool as a, a functional um, part of your digital ecosystem, right? 
So obviously, you know, Asterix is here uh, as part of that, right? Is to how do you connect things so that scientists uh, feel like they, they don't have to go to six different tools back and forth, whether that's connecting with ERPs, connecting with process equipments, regulatory systems, actual testing and measurement equipment so you can minimize the amount of manual data extraction um, and, and use that system to be properly uh, transmitted and communicating with all the other systems within Uncountable. And so we think our strong point and the, the reason why our customers like working with us is that we're creating an ecosystem where the data is properly structured to do all the advanced analysis you want to do. Um, and we also have a very flexible, highly configurable uh, environment so that we can work to across all these different chemistry areas. Um, and so that's really what how we view this as, as being helpful and critical into this larger ecosystem is like, you don't want another tool that sort of sits on its own. Uh, and you definitely don't want another tool that isn't thinking long term about what the right data structure is. Uh, and given our sort of background in, in artificial intelligence as a company, uh, we feel strongly that we've, we're properly building out that infrastructure for companies. Um, obviously, you can trust me or you can talk to uh, some of our other customers, you know, several of which we have case studies with online. Uh, I won't get into the details here, but I wanted to say uh, you know, we, we feel strongly that our, our relationships with our customers are our utmost priority and we want to be able to create the best and most tailored solution for them. Um, so, with that, I, I will pause and, and throw it back to Kevin if he's still there. Yep. Uh, and we can get the questions as they come up. We are, Will, and thank you for a great presentation. We appreciate that. We do have a few questions on the floor. First thing we want to do is obviously thank uh, for Will for a great presentation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.